We spoke about the profession of management consulting and the consultants themselves. Now let's focus on the careers. What does it mean to be a management consultant? And for myself, for four and a half years in consulting, it has been incredible. I had a chance to know many CEOs, to work in different industries and functions, to understand companies deeply. I have been working in a lot of different countries. I've been very well treated, staying at very nice hotels. I've stayed in, in Brazil, the capital of Brazil, in the very same room that Barack Obama stayed when he visited, just next to the palace of the presidents. I stayed in Rio de Janeiro in, in a room that was so big that I had a piano there. So you really cannot complain about all these things that consulting offers you. So let's look a little bit behind the scenes. What I think sums up the career of a consultant is that it really is very, very fast paced. It's really a boost in your career. It's like getting into a plane from going to point A to point B. It is the fastest way of getting there. Even a fast moving company is relatively slower to the things that happen in the consulting. So why is that? In a consulting firm, you're going to be working with problems at the top of an organization. Really the things that are in the mind of CEOs and senior executives at the company. That if you were an employee in that corporation, you would be in a much narrower role, in a much narrower domain. You would be working for your boss that may be five or six levels below the CEO. Whereas as a consultant, you're going to be there with the CEO. But of course, not everything is rosy. The career of consultant has, of course, pros and cons. So on the pro side, it's very much of a career boost. So you can either stay in consulting as a career and climb through the ranks, or you can have very good opportunities outside. Typically you work for clients, you do a good job, and then clients like you, and sometimes it happens, you get offers from clients. But also, um, it's a huge stamp that you get after being there. So it opens up a lot of opportunities for a career. Another advantage of consulting is the big network that you create. McKinsey, for example, has 27,000 people, alumni. And this is a network of people that are in very good positions, very high ranks, and that you can have a very easy access. As an alumni, you have a platform to interact with them. Another thing is the learning. I myself went to so many trainings. I joined McKinsey. A few weeks after joining McKinsey, I, I went to Milan for a week long, which was my first training. A few months later, I went to a training in a resort in Portugal, also one week long with people from all around the world. Then a few months later, I went to my third training, which was in Austria, in an Alpine University that McKinsey has. Well, that was only in my first uh, two years at McKinsey. I had these three huge, um, fantastic trainings, and on top of that, a lot of shorter trainings at the office where I would learn how to present, I would learn how to build financial models. I would, so one, one, one day long uh, training sessions. And also, even more than that, you have a lot of e-learning modules. You can learn about anything. So for people, for example, that, that join McKinsey, don't have any business knowledge, they have a lot of things like functional foundations, they teach you all on finance, on economics, on marketing. You have things on, even on the soft skills. Things on how do, you, how do you build a relationship with a client? How do you solve conflicts in your team? So all these things make a very, very strong learning and, and, and companies outside recognize that that learning is so strong. Because if you think about it, people are really the biggest assets that a consulting firm has. So that's why they invest so much in learning. Very few companies invest what McKinsey invests to train and to develop their people. Another thing uh, is compensation. It's, it's pretty good. You have, you have a very decent life. You earn uh, probably more than you, what you would earn anywhere else. Now, these are the pros, but the cons are important to be aware of. And for me, the biggest one is really lifestyle. There's no illusions there. You're going to work like hell. I had many weeks where I would be working until 2, 3 a.m. Of course, it's not always the case. I think sometimes people dramatize a bit. The lifestyle is a bit cyclical, it goes up and down. I had projects where I was able to leave around 7 and be at the hotel, play a tennis match and then go for a nice restaurant for dinner. But I also had projects that were like hell. There was very little sleep during the week. So I would arrive at, at the weekends and be completely wasted. And sometimes you don't work these long hours because you are forced to. Sometimes it's you yourself. You cannot decouple from the work. 
If you are going to meet a CEO next week, you're not going to sleep. You're going to be all the time thinking, is my analysis good enough? Is my solution good enough? So, a lot of things are happening in your head as well. Another curse of consultant, which may be very fun in the beginning, but it, it ends become boring, is traveling. Getting a plane every week, sometimes on a Sunday night, or in the mor Monday, very early morning, flying back and forth, in the beginning is very fun, you get a lot of miles, but it starts making a toll on you. At a certain moment, you get tired of spending most of your time in hotels. I myself have so many points from flying and from hotels, I can stay anywhere in the world for free, in Hilton and Hyatt and all that. So nice, very nice in the beginning. But I think that over time this balance that you have in the beginning starts shifting a bit. And that's where you think about, is it still worth being a consultant or should I move to another opportunity? And then the fi well, final thing, there's two more things that are worth mentioning. And this is, of course, my perspective on it. One is the conformity. These consulting firms have very strong values, but also very strong procedures, very strong ways of doing things. In McKinsey, we call it the McKinsey way. And sometimes you feel that you, are, you don't agree to everything, let's say. So you don't agree exactly the way you are structuring a project for a client. And you are the one going to the client and presenting that project. And sometimes you are in a trade-off. Should I do what I feel is the right thing, or should I abide to what the firm thinks is the best thing? Most of the time you have to conform to what is the norms, what is the culture. Sometimes you feel like rebelling a bit. And then finally, the other thing is the pressure. I mentioned this. You have a pressure to deliver. Not only you have pressure to perform because you are being constantly evaluated, but the evaluations is not the main source of pressure. I think the source of pressure is the responsibility that you have. And that responsibility sometimes takes you sleep at night and gets you some gray hair. It's not my case, fortunately. But some of my friends, they go to consulting two years after, you see the pictures, well, it had, it had an impact. So that's the price you pay to get all the pros, to get these opportunities for your career. So for most people in consulting, you, are, you go there not to have a career as a consultant. You go there to learn, to invest in yourself, and then to do something outside of consulting. So if you stay in a consulting firm, how does your career path look like? It's pretty similar across the top three consulting firms. So you can see that every two years you're jumping, you're doing something else. It's fast. In a normal organization you would take five or six years in the, in the same function. Project manager, senior project manager, etc. But it takes time. Here, Every two years you jump to something that is completely different, with a completely new level of responsibility. So you start typically, McKinsey call it the business analyst, normally right after university, and you start by analyzing things, getting data, etc. So you are part of, a, part of a small piece in solving the overall problem. After two years, you normally take a break, you do an MBA, McKinsey sponsors that MBA and then when you come back you are what McKinsey calls an associate. So the names differ a bit from uh, the companies but actually the functions they perform in the team are pretty much the same. And when you come back from an MBA you come as an associate and then you are managing a full work stream. So the project may be <coughs> divided into one, two and three and you're responsible for one of the big blocks of the project. So it's actually like managing the project in a smaller scale. And here you will have more responsibility. You are managing a business analyst, you have more responsibility with the client, you are speaking directly with the partners or with the leadership of the firms. And then you continue moving, after two years you become manager of the whole project. Then it's a completely new level of responsibility, then you actually manage everything. The team, the client, the problem solving process, everything is on you. Two years after you jump to another level, called the social principle at McKinsey, and that is where you start juggling two or three different projects and spending more and more time with actually face time with a client, selling new projects, thinking about their needs, etc. And then finally, two years after, typically you move, you become a partner. So the thing is that you are always close to jumping to another level. 
So actually, it's never a good moment to leave. And some people want to leave, but they don't, because the carrot is there in front of them. If you think about these entry-level positions, because McKinsey actually recruits either straight from university or from the MBAs, and so do all the other consulting firms. So if you think about these functions, what do you think that you would be doing? So you arrive at the client, you need to solve a problem, then what? What are the kind of tasks that you do on a daily basis? straight out of university you're supporting a project you would probably do a lot of data analysis and you would have an associate telling you or asking you to prepare something for the next meeting <coughs> you'll be sort of the run running the engines mm -hmm. speak in the beginning and that's I guess also a good way to sort of get to know how everything works mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you're dependent on it. yeah that's that's a big part of it you need you are one you are helping the engine of the project run by that's one of the big things you do, gathering the data, going after the data, and then performing this analysis and then conclude what is this data telling me. And then fitting that into the solution of the project. So collecting data, analyzing data, there's a few more things that you also do as, um, as a consultant. You present a lot to the client. Present your conclusions, have meetings, brainstorming, whatever. <coughs> it's a lot of also client interaction. And sometimes you work on implementing things. You go and you run a pilot, you help implementing a pilot. You go and go to a manufacturing plant and help apply a new, uh, a new design of that manufacturing plant. So there's also some implementation that you do, even as a junior person. And then finally, this bonding, you start pretty soon doing it, bonding with the client. Trying to get to know, normally, the more uh, junior team members of the client, but bonding with them because we need, you need their collaboration. You need them to be on your side, to provide you data, to give you access to the company. But that's all on the client side. You're going to do a lot also on the firm side. A lot of your time is going to be spent with your team problem solving, with your engagement manager, with partners. A lot of your time is going to be spent traveling, either traveling to a specific location or even visiting offices of the clients, going to the office back and forth. So. Taxis, airplanes are going to be familiar to you. Another thing is training. You actually spend a lot of time training. You take full weeks where you go to a remote location to be trained. Besides these trainings, presential trainings, you also have online trainings. There's a huge online portal where you can basically learn about anything. On-demand learning. And then you, the office also holds some activities, most of the time fun activities, parties, uh, McKinsey, we have the Values Day, which is the office stops and everyone comes and discusses the values of McKinsey applied in their engagements. And then finally, other type of events. You may be called to go to recruiting events, you may be called to go to speeches. So it's a very intense life and time management becomes an essential skill to master, otherwise you don't sleep. Now, how do you start getting good at this? How do you become a good business analyst or associate. Well, you, you basically, every project you, you go in, you go through this cycle. And the cycle begins with understanding the team dynamics, understanding your role in the team. What am I supposed to say when I'm meeting with my team members? What am I supposed to say to a client? How am I even supposed to write an email asking for information or, or sharing an idea? And then after that you start learning more and more how to problem solve, how to create a model, a cash flow model, more technical things, or even more softer things like interviewing. How do I get the things that I want while building a relationship when interviewing someone? After that there's a lot of things to understand in terms of leveraging the firm resources. You have so many resources out there. Well, how do you tap them? If you want, you can have people working for you at the firm 24 hours a day and seven days a week. In India, in Costa Rica, there are centers, research centers, there are production centers, there's a lot of things at your disposal. So just knowing your way around, who to speak to, how, where to send things so that they come back to you at the right time and with the right quality, that's, that's also takes some time to develop. And then you're gonna start being very good at creating slides, but it takes time, it takes time. The first time is, is right. My first slides were were terrible. Uh, in hindsight, I can understand why they were terrible, but at the beginning I didn't. I did my best to do a slide to convey an analysis, 
and my engagement manager would just put it on the rubbish. Of course, that's, as, you, as, you, uh, as you progress, you, you become almost intuitive. You are doing an analysis and you're already thinking of the output. This is how I'm going to communicate it to the client. And the fifth part is really being a good communicator. Being able to speak in a simple, in a simple way to the client without complex jargon and convincing them to take action. And those things, every new project, you go into this cycle again. And as you move into this cycle, you become more and more comfortable into becoming a very good and solid consultant. And a good and solid consultant is one that has these four pillars in place. One of them is thought leadership. So that means being very good at problem solving, at this logical and structured approach of solving problems, and also developing knowledge. So when you go in an industry, really investigating deeply what is this industry about? What are the drivers? What are competitors doing? So in reality, when you start a project, you would spend two or three days and nights reading all the material you can find about that industry, about that client. So that allows you to be on a good stance to really have a contribution, an intellectual contribution to do. Another pillar is the client. So that means inspiring the client, achieving the buy-in, making sure that everyone agrees, that there are no nasty surprises. That the, last, the worst thing that can happen for a consultant is you arrive to the steer committee and you're presenting to the CEO and all the executive team and then in the middle of the presentation people start questioning you, saying that, that those numbers don't make sense or I don't agree with this. You don't do that. You need to have the client buy-in beforehand and that's a skill in itself as well. Now, besides these, we have the team leadership, which is a very important skill that you develop over time. How you make sure that your team is focused, working on the right things, and also learning and developing along the way. And the final thing is the process management. You need to be able to control all the variables. You have people to help you. You have uh, assistants that help you with the more uh, logistical tasks of scheduling meetings, booking flights, and all these things. But you also need to manage the entire problem-solving process in terms of uh, getting getting the, the leadership team involved in helping you solve the problem. But you need to feed your partners constantly with what you are doing. Why do you think what you're doing is relevant? What is the client relationship? They're going to be on the, fall if you don't, uh, on the phone calling you if you don't do that. So better be proactive and manage also their expectations. Because if you don't say anything, they will think that everything is going perfectly um, and, then, and, and they will not contribute as they should to your project. So that's why you need to involve them. And when you have all these things in place, your focus starts shifting. In the beginning, when I, when I did my first project, it was so tough that I felt like I was in a boxing ring and I was being hit really hard. My goal in the first project was just to stay up, to don't fall on the ground. But as you get better and better, you, you start getting more comfortable. And then you, you shift the focus, and the focus is no longer surviving, the focus is delivering impact, really making a difference for your client, and that's where the fun begins. just want to show you one example of a chart, a beginner's chart. In McKinsey we call it the German chart. No offense, we call it German because it's, there's so many things in it, uh, and the Germans for some reason like to, to do these very heavy charts. Well, this doesn't work. The clients get confused, they get bored, so this is an example of a chart that would end up in a rubbish. So it takes a lot of skill to be able to say everything that you want to say here in a much simpler and neater slide. Now how is life after consulting, after you learn all these things? And life after consulting is full of opportunities. Consulting is really a very good stamp on anyone's CV. And CEOs, senior executives, they like consultants because they can speak, they can relate easily to them. The consultants tend to understand the company as a whole to be strategic in their thinking. So what do people do when they leave consulting? So a lot of people go to work for corporations. Sometimes they work for former clients. That's a very common thing. You do a project, the project goes well, and the client invites you. It, it happened to me several times. I had invitations. Of course, they're not open invitations, but the client tells, well, I think you did a good job here. If, if any time you would like to, to join us and, and, and pursue opportunities, we are open for that. And how does McKinsey or the other firms react to that? You could think, well, maybe the firms are not going to like that because they are losing valuable consultants. That's true. But on the other hand, 
if you as a consultant leave for a senior position at a client, you are going to be a potential client for the firm. So there's a very close relationship. These companies out there are full of people from McKinsey, BCG and Bain at senior levels. Now other people go for studies, most of the time for MBAs. After you are a business analyst at McKinsey, you are almost supposed to, to do an MBA. The firm pays you for that, so why would you not do it? So almost everyone does. I did mine at INSEAD, sponsored by McKinsey. And then some people end up launching their own companies. So they take what they've learned from consulting and then they start something of their own. Sometimes even consulting practices. Having that stamp from the big firms helps them in getting new business.